Cool. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Gunnar Haslam, and uh, welcome to the Bunker Artist Salon for tonight. Uh, La Sante Humaine, or the Human Use of Human Circuits. Um, this is going to be kind of building off a workshop I gave at Control, um, where I work. Um, it's a store in Brooklyn that sells modular synthesizers. And I wanted to give a talk there to explain the fundamentals of synthesis uh, to customers, the fundamentals of um, sort of uh, Fourier analysis, um, which is the building up of complicated sounds from uh, simple sine waves. I wanted to explain a bit about how modular synthesizers work. And I wanted to give people an intuition um, about how they can use synthesizers to do whatever they want. Um, I There's a huge culture right now on YouTube and on um, forums and things of synthesizer videos, modular videos, that seem to me to always talk about uh, modules you need to buy um, and how you need to patch them, right ways to do things, and all this. Um, and what I want to do here is a couple things, but but first I want uh, to remind everyone that the synthesizer is basically just a big toy. Um, there there's there's nothing wrong to do with it. Um, there's no right way to patch it. There's no right way to think about patching it. Uh, it's really just up to your imagination, and it's up to um, I know it's up to you to follow wherever the sounds take you. Um, there's a common sort of saying um, in the sort of music technology world that the perfect synthesizer is the one that um, allows you to take the sound that's in your head and quickly realize it. And this is something I've always really disliked because um, I believe that uh, the more interesting use of synthesizers is for exploration, to use them to explore sounds you could have never thought of before. Um, our imaginations are really, really great, um, but they're limited um, in many ways to things we've already seen and things we've already heard. Um, the synthesizer allows you to explore things um, in a much more open and free uh, sort of I don't know, a environment. And so I, I, I don't want to, um, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to sort of talk about how to make like, you know, a 303 baseline here. Because, um, you know, if you want to do that, you can just, you know, get a plug in that does a 303. It does it really well. Um, the whole point for me of modular synthesizers is to sort of um, give you a palette to explore and patch things in, you know, what could be called the wrong way um, to really, I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of uh, restating things a couple times here, but yeah, to really just explore all the capabilities that are here. Um, that's why I called the talk La Santes Human or Human Synthesis, um, to bring a sort of uh, humanity to the synthesizer. Um, the subhead for this is on the human use of human circuits. And that's um, inspired by this book, uh, The Human Use of Human Beings by Norbert Wiener. Uh, Norbert Wiener was a scientist, mathematician, uh, kind of everything. Um, he was the father of cybernetics, um, which at this point you could say is an early form of what we now call artificial intelligence, AI. Um, cybernetics was all about systems, information, control, um, and had numerous applications and was uh, incredibly popular as a discipline um, from sort of its beginnings in the mid 40s um, up through the 70s. But uh, strangely, uh, nowadays where everything is about AI, machine learning. Um, cybernetics as a term is, is, is kind of out of favor. But what I think um, is missing is that in this book, Wiener um, tried to 
put a sort of societal um, spin on cybernetics. He had basically written a, a book on cybernetics, the sort of founding uh, technical book on cybernetics that went over all of the um, theories and, and math and everything. And this was a book he wrote for a larger audience um, to sort of explain what cybernetics really meant um, at a more at a, yeah, at, a, at a more fundamental um, level and how it could be applied to society. And what I think um, is most revealing is even at the time he wrote the book in the late 50s, cybernetics was being applied um, in societal contexts. Um, and the sort of central thesis of the book that Wiener is, is, is making is that um, these applications of AI, um, using AI to, um, in the 60s, for example, it, it would have been, uh, the 50s and 60s would have been very common for the U.S. military to want to use U.S., uh, to, to use AI systems, cybernetics, things like this, to play, uh, you know, uh, war games, to, you know, determine if, uh, you know, the validity of, a signal if it meant that you know a, a nuclear warhead had been sent off or something. These were often the the sort of contexts in which cybernetics were used and w in which AI were used. But further, the sort of burgeoning um, talk about cybernetics at the time uh, was that AI could be used to make humans more productive, um, to make humans uh, yeah I mean to increase the productive ha capacity of humans. And um, Wiener really kind of fights against this. He, he draws in the middle of the book a, a, a sort of um, analogy with ants. Um, he says that the, the, the current proponents of cybernetics um, really want humans to be more like ants. And the problem with ants is that, yes, they're a very, uh, they're a very efficient um, species. They're, they're, they can, you know, I don't know what the fuck ants do, but you know they can carry a leaf from one area to the other. I don't know, um, and they're they're very good at it. But it's also like you know a completely authoritarian fascist society, right? Um, Wiener's whole thing was saying, look, like what humans are good at is being humans, and humans are not good at being productive. They're not good at at um, at being really efficient. Um, humans bring a sort of creativity to things, and AI um, should not be used to turn humans into robots. And it should not be used as a stand, as, as a sort of stand-in for situations in which humans um, make decisions based on very human characteristics. Um, and that's a sort of long-winded thing, but the, the book, The Human Use of Human Beings, I wanted to um, pull on that concept to the synthesizer, the human use of human circuits, to say that a lot of uh, the ways in which people use synthesizers are um, to increase their productive capacity, to basically um, create tracks faster, um, to you know quickly create the baseline that they want, and then there's a there's a certain place for that. But what I want to sort of invite you to do, and in this lecture um, lecture like conversation, um, I, I want to invite you to explore instead. Um, to not try to figure out the most efficient way to use this, but to use your humanity to sort of guide you and to just start patching things and let your ears, and just follow your ears and see where they take you. Um, that's what I've sort of come to at this point um, in my music making. Um, and it's something that I hope to... Um, I don't know, pass on to you guys and uh, and yeah, to make you just sort of stop and think, especially at, at this point um, when we're all sort of quarantined and, you know, in this whole thing, um, there's been a lot of talk about people being productive um, during this time. And I think that's terrible. Like, you should take this time to be not productive. You should take this time to explore and just experience things, um, to use your synthesizers and just play with them and see what happens. Um, anyway, that's sort of what I want to get at in this. Um, I want to sort of 
you know, sort of a, a more nuts and bolts thing. I want to um, go through the surge a little bit um, and, you know, sort of explain a bit about what it does. Um, but I don't want to get too caught up in the surge itself because um, I personally like the surge because of how open it is. Um, and we'll get into that. But a lot of the way things I talk about today, I really want to be applicable to um, to you uh, at home using whatever gear you have, using whatever synthesizers you have. Um, yeah, I, I just want um, I, I just want this to be something that everyone can take from, even even if you're not a musician. Um, you know, uh, whatever medium you work in, I, I want this sort of the idea of exploration um, and of using circuits um, in fun and interesting ways. Um, I'd just like to um, for that to be sort of the major take home thing. Um, so uh, I am going to try to keep this super conversational. Um, so I'll be reading the chat the whole time and feel free to ask questions. Um, if I miss it, then I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, it, it's this is the f my first time streaming, so um, I'm not a natural at this. But um, I am going to try to, you know, keep this uh, a back and forth kind of thing as much I can. There is a delay in um, what I'm seeing and what you're hearing, so do keep that in mind. I think it's about 30 seconds or something, um, as I was doing some little tests here. Um, but yeah, I guess I'll first ask if anyone has any questions, um, and I'll sort of see here um, but yeah if you if you have any questions um, just post them in the chat and uh, you know we'll we'll I'll, I'll sort of answer those first questions uh, straight off Abby's asking for the volume to go up so I will turn the volume up Okay, let me know if it's if it's ever too um, ever too low. The, the the thing is, I have been keeping the um, I've been keeping it down a bit because uh, the surge can really uh, blow up. Um, the surge can set out some send out some really high voltages. So um, you know, I'm gonna have to keep the hands on the the mixer a bit. Oh, I am drinking uh, Calvados. Yeah, and it's good. Okay, um, so just a little bit about uh, what we're using here um, for now. Um, we have the surge here, and then I also have a scope down here, and um, the double knot here, which I will get into a little bit. What are some recommendations of a fun starter play around synth or something kind of mindless and not too overwhelming? I really like the double knot, um, like I just showed. Um, it is a self-contained synthesizer um, that, yeah, it more than anything, um, really allows you to kind of just play around. Um, it is going to be pretty terrible at making bass lines or melodies. Um, but what it is going to do, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a very fun thing I, I i kind of i really like the idea of synthesizers for for children for infants um i feel like this is a synthesizer that like a a child would have a lot of fun with um because they would just patch a bunch of things and uh everything would be sort of technically wrong but you know really actually very fun so uh mpc what's in the surge so uh yeah let's that's a good place to start so i'm going to sort of zoom in here, sort of dive into the surge itself. So um, I will start, let me just take some of these cables out. Um, I'll start from, I guess I'll just do it right to left. It doesn't necessarily make sense, but um, whatever. Uh, uh, the rightmost module here is called the wave multipliers. Um, it's actually uh, three 
separate modules um, and they multiply a signal in different ways. Um, the topmost one is basically a, a VCA or a voltage controlled amplifier. Um, what that does is basically you have an input, an output, and a knob here, which turns up and turns down the, the volume. And you can automate that with voltage. Um, this top one is like everything in the surge, not um, totally uh, normal for a VCA. Um, it has a high and low mode, um, which one of these will do some pretty intense uh, distortion. Um, and you can do fun things with it, like uh, you can use it as like pseudo ring modulation in certain ways. The middle is the um, is a different flavor of wave multiplier. It's it's what's commonly called a wave folder. Um, you this circuit um, has been used in a lot of Buchla synthesizers. Um, is one of the more famous sort of sounds of the surge and um, has also been uh, used by uh, Make Noise and a, a lot of modular synthesizer companies now. Um, what a what a um, what a what this section of the wave multiplier does, and what any wave folder does, is it basically distorts the signal and folds it over on in and on itself. And we can maybe look at those in the scope um, later as they sort of come up. Um, but just to get sort of through the surge, and then the bottom one is a nonlinear wave multiplier. It's similar to the middle section in that it's going to make you know um, some interesting timbral uh, sounds. But um, it sounds quite different from the middle one. Um, and there are also some ins and outs um, that can happen. Uh, I see. So Surge is a collection of modules. So, yeah, Surge is um, it, Surge was a uh, company started by a guy named Serge Cherepinen in uh, Berkeley in the late 60s. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, they were... At the time, different synthesizers, different modular synthesizers were um, sort of uh, specific um, and sort of closed systems. You didn't have this thing of Eurorack where a lot of different companies made modules that could speak to each other. So you had Moog uh, systems and you had Buchla systems. And the Surge um, was just another system made by um, this guy. Um, and it became quite famous um, uh, and morphed over the years. Um, the sort of surge development stopped probably in the early 80s. Um, and it's kind of come back now as um, modular synthesizers have come back. And yeah, um, and so there are all sorts of different like classic surge circuits, um, some of which are very obviously sort of synthesizer applicable, something like the mixer or the filter here, um, and others which are, you know, a little weirder, like the SSG over here. Um, but anyways, just getting through. Um, the Resonant EQ is a 10-band uh, equalizer, so similar to an equalizer on your um, mixing console, but uh, much weirder. Um, it has 10 bands from 29 hertz all the way up to 11 kilohertz. Um, and you can do feedback in it, and these bands will resonate um, quite loudly. Um, it really colors the sound in a very interesting way. Uh, but there's no real, like, voltage control over anything. But, um, but yeah. Uh, Muff, this is... Uh, these are all um, uh, surge modules designed by Random Source. Um, who are now sort of the, uh, yeah, they're, they're the sort of, um, Surge is working with them now. Um, so they kind of uh, are the flag carriers for the, for the, I don't know, 20, for the 20s now that we're in. Yeah, the roaring 20s. Um, okay, um, dual slope generator is probably the most famous Surge module. Um, if you know anything about uh, modular synthesizers, you probably know about the make noise maths, which is directly inspired by the sur by the dual slope generator. Um, and uh, the dual slope generator, there are two of them. They're completely independent. Um, and so this is just one slope generator. And it's uh, really the way it works um, is quite 
is, is super interesting. We'll get into it uh, a bit later. But it creates a voltage that just goes up and down. Um, that's it. Um, we'll look at stuff on the scope later just to sort of um, get a better idea. Uh, on the right of the slope generator here is this one, uh, this one little module, which is a CV processor. It takes three inputs and gives an output. Um, this is useful for, you know, so if, well, okay, let's just hook up the scope. So what I can do is I can uh, start cycling the slope generator to create a triangle wave. And if I take that trying if I take that triangle wave and put it in to the slope generator, what I will get on the scope, let's get the scope in here. Um, this is the uh, signal at full strength, the one just coming out of this jack on the slope generator. And all this allows me to do is turn it down and also to turn it upside down. Um, so that's kind of the whole point of this simple module, um, which is uh, which is pretty crucial, actually. Um, funny story, um, Morton Sabotnik, when he first designed the Buchla, um, realized all of a sudden after it had been built that there was no uh, way to do this sort of um, to do this uh, processing of control voltages, um, which uh, is is pretty important. So um, it was only with the se second Buchla that um, they had uh, CV processors. Um, it's one of those things that it's so uh, simple, you kind of think it's dumb, but uh, you realize that you need it actually uh, pretty much in every situation. So um, to the right of that is the variable QVCF. It's a filter, um, multi-mode. Um, you have low pass, uh, band pass, high pass, and notch outputs. Um, it's a famous filter. We'll play with it a little bit later. Um, and it's uh, a lot of fun. Um, the stereo mixer here, uh, two channel stereo mixer, gain, pan. You have voltage control over the pan, um, ins, auxiliary ins, um, and then your outputs. And this is just going to my 16 channel mixer. Uh, then we get to the uh, SSG, the smooth stepped generator, um, which uh, is kind of probably the most head scratcher of surge modules um, for most people. Um, uh, what it does, uh, the smooth side, this is the smooth generator, basically takes a signal and smooths it out. Um, so... Uh, I'll show that a bit later. Um, and the step signal basically takes a signal and chops it up into steps. Um, that's really what it does. It actually, I guess, is kind of self, sort of self-explanatory. But why you would want to do any of those things um, is not always obvious. Um, but uh, in the surge, um, the smooth can be used to do anything from slewing to being an oscillator to... Uh, being a VCA to being a low pass filter to being, I mean, it, it can kind of do everything. Um, and in tandem with the step generator, um, it can, it's a very powerful random voltage generator. Um, in the middle, we have a, a noise generator, white noise, pink noise, and the sample and hold um, output, which um, just so you guys can hear these, I think, yeah, the scope is still on the screen. So the white noise sounds like you would expect. Uh, oh, got to hook it up to the mixer. The white noise sounds like you would expect. Um, the pink noise is a bit low passed. Um, the sample and hold source is this weird kind of... Um, collection of six like always detuned um, sawtooth waves I think 
it's really weird. It's strange looking. It sounds kind of nice a lot of the time. Sometimes I just use it as audio um, straight up. Um, is this config inspired by a certain original search panel? No, it's not. Um, this is just kind of uh, of the current uh, kits uh, offered by Random Source. Um, these are sort of the ones that I thought um, were the most surgy or something. Um, you know, they were the ones that could sort of uh, do the most and, and do sort of the weirdest things. They were, they were the ones uh, prone to lots of uh, feedback usage um, and just really, really flexible. Things that could do a lot. The dual slope generator can do basically everything. The smooth step generator can basically do everything. And then the other side here is, uh, this is actually another dual slope generator, um, but it's just been changed around a bit. The panel controls, um, one of them is, al is always cycling um, to give you a, a pretty rudimentary oscillator. Um, and yeah, so that's the inspiration for this, um, you know, a sort of uh, a, a panel that allows a lot of things to happen. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, if you have any more questions before I go on, I'll take them. Um, but I also just kind of want to start hearing some sounds. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, before I do that, I'll introduce the double knot as well. Um, I'll introduce just kind of the basic things of the double knot and then, um, ah, difference between banana cables and Eurorack cables. Yeah. Um, that's another sort of key, uh, thing to the surge. Um, the use of banana cables is really nice because, um, if you've ever used a Eurorack synthesizer or anything, um, I now have the sample and hold noise source uh, coming out, but when I unplug it, it just kind of goes out. Um, the problem with uh, Eurorack cables is um, they carry actually two signals on them, uh, a ground and then the signal itself. And so when you unpatch a Eurorack cable or patch it in, um, what you get is you'll have the momentary connection of ground to the, um, to, to, you know, whatever is being patched. And um, that'll create some annoying buzzing and, and noises. Um, the th cool thing with uh, the banana cables is you don't even necessarily need to plug it in. The connection is one to one. So I can plug it in and hear the sample and hold. I can just touch it to the rim of the jack basically and hear that. And I can touch it and, and hear the white noise. Um, the connection is, is basically immediate. Um, the other nice thing, of course, is the fact that the cables are stackable, um, so I can plug one on top of the other. Um, there are also these holes in the side, if you can see them. Um, if you're getting a little more fancy with uh, your patching. Um, but the reason that's super helpful as well um, is because the surge is really about um, feedback and is about patch programming. Um, feedback is sort of the central tenant of cybernetics. Um, the idea of a system in which, uh, you know, the output comes back to the input. Um, you know, if any of you have played with music at all, you know what feedback is. You know, when you hold the microphone up to a speaker, um, you get feedback. When you play with uh, a delay line um, and add a lot of feedback, you know what that sounds like. Um, but feedback can be used not just in the audio path, but in the uh control path and all your control signals, everything can be feeding off it, it off itself. Um, and more importantly, I think that um, being able to stack all these things on top of each other and feedback everything into itself, um, you very quickly start to uh, not have any idea what's going on, um, which again, sort of coming back to the idea of not, you know, uh, of exploring and, and, and doing things with an open ear. Um, you know, it's something that really uh, drew me to the surge in particular, um, drew me to the double knot, which is very uh, surge inspired. Um, the double knot um, is a bit strange and we'll go into its particular, um, it's sort of a uh, particular things in a bit, but I just want to um, introduce the sort of easiest uh, part of the double knot, which is that, um, the left side here, these three knobs, 
Um, I have an oscillator, an oscillator, and then this is an FM uh, bus. So um, this uh, increases the amount that one oscillator is uh, modulating the frequency of another. Um, and we can get into the rest of the double knot a bit later. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to use these as two oscillators. You'll notice that I don't have any oscillators in this system. There are modules like the DSG or the smooth step generator that can be used as oscillators. Even the filter can be used as an oscillator. Um, but uh, it's nice to just have uh, two sort of constant oscillators coming in um, to then play with. So let's hear how, the, how this all sounds. Um, so what I'm going to do is unpatch these. And I'll start kind of recreating a patch that I was doing this morning, which is sort of what I do all the time, um, which is a really simple patch. Um, you know, just kind of making a, a tone and listening to it and playing with it. Um, so let me just get some longer patch cables. Okay, so all I did was patch um, the two oscillators from the double knot. So we have oscillator one of the double knot uh, looks like this. Um, the double knot oscillators are roughly triangles, um, but you know, not quite. Um, and then the other oscillator is at a much higher frequency. I can turn this down. And you see it's actually kind of moving around a bit. Um, that's why I love the double knot. It, it, um, it's not the most stable thing in the world, um, which is really nice if you're trying to make, uh, trying to play with sound. Um, okay, so let's hear, let's just hear these. So what I'll do is I'll take um, the output of this uh, mixer here. Um, this is, as I said earlier, it's a CV processor, but you can use it as a, as a mixer as well. And I'm gonna go from the mixer um, into the, uh, uh, I'm gonna go from this sort of CV processor mixer into the sort of typical stereo mixer. And turn it up. Okay, so I have oscillator one turned up here. I'm gonna turn up the other one. So now these are those two oscillators, um, just triangle waves coming from the double knot being added together. Um, so if we scope the output here, you can see that we have the one oscillator that's up and then as we add the second, we start to get some movement and, you know, a more interesting sound. I'm going to turn this up. Okay, um, so uh, I think from this point I'm just going to start, uh, you know, playing around um, and sort of explaining things as I go on the way, but uh, please, again, if you have questions, ask me. Um, I, I really want this to sort of, uh, I don't know, be a, a, a two-way or whatever um, uh, conversation and everything. Um, so yeah. Um, so uh, this is fun. Um, you know, the stereo mixer, we can pan it left and right. We can turn it up and down. But for now, we're just going to listen to it. And what I'll do as well um, is uh, we'll just kind of throw the filter in here. So I'm going to go into the variable Q filter. And let's, let's just listen to the low pass. And again, we 
can scope the low pass output. And we can play with the resonance here. So let's keep it uh, there for now. Um, now already I'm kind of into this sound. I, I like really sort of simple sounds and there's actually a lot going on in this sound. You can hear uh, just from the beating of the two oscillators, um, from those then beating with the resonance uh, of the filter, um, these sort of extra harmonics from these uh, not perfect triangles. Um, everything is kind of, it's a more complicated sound than, I mean, it is just two oscillators going into a filter, um, but it is, you know, it's, it's, it's already a pretty interesting and nice sound. Um, but there are a couple of things we can do with it. So one is um, we can start to uh, frequency modulate the oscillators with each other. Um, so let's, and so just to show you, on the double knot, that's just this knob, um, which is just going to, uh, yeah, just frequency modulate one oscillator to the other and the other back to the first, and they just kind of continue in this sort of cycle. Um, so let's play with that a little, just that one knob. So you can hear that there's a whole world of sounds in there at some points it starts to latch into a, a sort of a rhythm um, that slows down as you increase the FM. Um, can 3U and 4U modules work together? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, you know, uh, you'll have to convert the signal um, from, uh, you know, an eighth inch uh, cable to banana. Um, and there are boxes and sort of modules that do that. Um, it's, it's sometimes fun to work with something that has its own kind of thing. Um, even the surge modules that Random Source uh, builds for Eurorack can sometimes react weirdly with other standards of other manufacturers. There's something about um, all the circuits being designed by one person, um, the way in which certain outputs are buffered, the way in which um, certain modules and circuits just act. Um, that, uh, I don't know, there's something in, in which the way all these things play together, which is really nice. Um, but anyway, uh, just playing with that FM knob, there's a whole world in there, um, but uh, we can kind of keep going. And another thing we can do here, um, just to start talking about feedback, is we can uh, do a very simple feedback, insert a very simple feedback loop. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is take the output of the filter and use that to FM the oscillators. So that'll create a feedback loop where the oscillators are going into the filter, the filter is controlling the oscillators, and the oscillators are going into the filter and, and all of that. So we could take actually any of the filter outputs. I'll take the bandpass output for now. Um, or, you know what, I can just take the low pass output, use the same uh, filter that we're hearing to modulate the oscillators. And then I can play with the other, um, the other filter outputs just to see what those do. Two pass. 
attach cables because uh, I'm uh, modulating both oscillators from the one filter output. just to go into the audio path of the filter but to modulate the filter itself and this is going to introduce yet another feedback loop. And this is what you'll find with feedback as, as you just saw there. Um, there are certain points where um, typically when you're using synthesizers you can expect a uh, you know a noises to sounds to vary uh, you know quite smoothly um, but when you have these feedback patches you'll you'll notice like right there there's this weird thing where the, all of the things that are feeding back with each other um, start to kind of feedback and sympathy and start to actually sort of grow and, and create something weird. is feedback the filter into itself. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is um, take the input and go into the uh, auto gain control input and well actually no, I'll go back. And now I'm going to take the band pass. I'm going to turn the volume down a bit. I'm going to take the band pass and go into the input as well. Yeah, so like I said, the surge can sometimes blow up. I uh, really apologize for anyone who's listening on, on headphones. Um, but it's that kind of thing that uh, is pretty fun. Um, and it's why this gets really, uh, I don't know, um, why this can get really interesting. Um, let's see, so... <coughs> so yeah, you can see that there's all these weird... <coughs> And now we can play maybe instead of the band pass, we can feed back the high pass in. The band pass output of the variable Q is actually uh, rotated 90 degrees from the other uh, output, so um, that's why it can be a bit more gnarly. Um, but I guess uh, I'm going to, uh, just for the next couple minutes, just kind of play with this and uh, 
kind of do what I normally do, which is just kind of find a nice tone. Um, really what I think uh, is sort of the most fun uh, thing to do here is, is to have a really simple patch and just kind of do a bit of uh, basically like, I don't know, uh, feeling it out, a bit of like Tai Chi, just kind of moving the knobs and just kind of letting your ear guide you to where something might be interesting. Um, and especially when you have feedback going on, um, as you saw, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these knob settings will be really, really subtle um, because something's feeding back in a weird way, um, and maybe it's feeding back uh, to different destinations, and uh, the whole routing of everything gets um, really confusing. Um, but that's what can be really nice. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna like play around for a couple minutes. Um, and while I'm doing that, uh, feel free to ask any questions. just with very, very tiny movements of this frequency knob. And again, there's just a frequency of a low-pass filter. Um, anyone who, you know, uses synthesizers knows what that generally sounds like. But you'll tell that, you'll be able to tell that here, uh, it's changing things in, in much uh, weirder ways. And with very, very slight movements. looking waveforms. It's fun to play around with them and sometimes let your eyes be the guide too. Thoughts on banana hammock? Is that a is that a synthesizer thing? I mean generally I'm pro banana hammock. Um, I don't know if I'm going to the Rockaways anytime soon, but yeah, I mean normally banana hammocks are great.
how am I using the surge in a compositional sense or is it pure sound as music for you these days? I mean, yeah, it's pretty much the latter. Um, I think uh, the way, I mean, of course, anyone can use anything in however they want. Um, I like using the surge um, mostly just for making sounds. Um, I do it with no computer, with no nothing. Usually it's just the surge and the mixer um, and the double knot and it, de it really depends on what I'm hearing and kind of what I'm in the mood for. If I'm making something like this, maybe I want to record something that is, you know, um, sort of a, I don't know, just playing around. Um, other times I'll find a sound, you know, as you, as you, as you hear, you can, you can sort of lock into weird sounds on here um, that you never would have uh, dreamt up and sometimes you just kind of lock into a weird sound and, and want to use that. Um, and so you'll I'll, I'll record that sound and then just have it as, uh, you know, in the library as a sound to use for later. Um, who knows what it'll be, but, you know, to throw it into a um, Ableton session and, you know, just have it there as a sound to be messed with. Um, usually that's kind of more of what I do these days is I just make sounds to be used at some point in the future. Um, who knows what for. Um, Okay, so um, next I want to pull in the resonant EQ. Um, I see a couple people in the chat who I know are, are resonant EQ um, acolytes like me. Um, and as I said earlier, it's just basically a desk EQ, 10 bands. Um, but the way in which it um, accentuates the sound, the way in which it kind of pushes up certain frequency bands, um, the way in which it removes them, and then the way in which uh, feedback plays a role uh, is really fun. So I'm just going to take this sound and run it through the resonant EQ. turn the level up so I can start playing with the bands um, starting from the highest band 11 kilohertz there's not much 11 kilohertz in this because we are I mean even though there's a lot of weird stuff going on we are still going through a low pass filter this is pushing up to 5.2 kilohertz 2.8 one point five seven hundred seventy seven four hundred and eleven two hundred and eighteen one hundred fifteen sixty one and twenty nine. These frequencies were chosen for the res EQ because well they're tuned to a major seventh. Um that was deliberate. Um so that uh, you would get um, interactions that were not uh, harmonic. You know, they're not perfect fourths, they're not major thirds or anything. Um, why, why it starts at 29 and then goes up, I don't know. Um, but they all sound great. Yeah, 777 is great. I mean, it's one of my favorite Autoker songs. Um, okay, so that's what they all sound like. Now, um, there is actually a feedback knob here. Um, which is similar to taking the output and going into the input, um, but just with a sort of attenuator on it. Um, so if I turn up the feedback knob about halfway, a little more.
if you push the feedback really hard, um, you'll get, uh, I mean, it'll basically blow up. I'm going to turn this down a bit. So you hear that, um, uh, which can be a lot of fun. Um, it's not always the most fun when you're not expecting it, but, um, and even with the feedback here, things start to interact really weirdly. This 1.5 band is like actually pretty low, but it's feeding back right there. Oh, uh, the oscilloscope output isn't changing because I didn't plug it into where I'm at. So let's do that. So output of the Res EQ. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So here you'll see the scope sound changing. And one other fun thing you can do um, is there are these comb outputs. So the upper comb are the sort of um, the the comb filter that's the 11 kilohertz, the 2.8 kilohertz, the 777, the 218, and the 61. That's just those isolated. And the bottom comb are the other ones. So, uh, you know, it's, it can be a fun way to isolate sounds, but it can also be a fun thing to feed back the combs into the input and see what happens. going to do now is sort of talk a little bit about the wave multipliers because they're another interesting module and one that uh, is really nice uh, for feedback. So um, we'll take this sound that we've been working with um, from the variable queue. I'm going to use actually a longer patch cable here just to Okay, um, so this is the top uh, wave multiplier. Like I said, 
it can operate basically as a VCA. Or do more interesting, well, neither is really that interesting right now. Let me get a more. Okay, that's a nice sound. Okay. So that's in low. And that's in high. You can tell the difference. Um, it can be, really start to come alive when you uh, use voltage control on it. Um, let's use the output of the mixer. And we could, of course, cycle one of the dual slope generators to get something that isn't part of the sort of patch already. Um, So you have basically two flavors. Um, the middle wave multiplier. Um, has this sort of classic sound um, that uh, you'll sort of recognize from yeah, Pukula synthesizers and things like that. Um, again, you can hold to control that. You could also go instead into the second input. Or I can take the output from this mixer instead. Or I can take the output from the filter. Take the input from one of the filter outputs. This is one reason I like banana cables so much is, you know, you can kind of just play with these outputs and see what's sounding one fun thing though is you can also feed back the output into the input Another fun thing you can do is take the input out altogether and start feeding back the module in and of itself. So now, this is just the output going to the input um, and going to the scope and going to the mixer. Um, so none of this that we were playing with earlier is even part of anything anymore. So sometimes you get something, sometimes you don't. Let's throw another patch cable in here. With this middle section, it can sometimes be hard to self-oscillate. You need to kind of kickstart it. Eh, it's not going now. I mean, that's the thing with feedback patching is, you know, uh, you never really know what's uh, going on, um, and that's totally fine. Um, the bottom output, if we just kind of go back to the uh, input we had before. Listening to the output, we turn up. You see this has a kind of different flavor to it. And again, though, we can do some feedback patching so we can take the outputs.
there's actually two different outputs here. One of them is uh, unipolar, the other is bipolar, uh, which is the difference between the white and the black. Again, if we plug, if we take the input out, Okay, I think it dropped out for a bit, but should be back in. Okay, um, so now we can, you know, just take everything out. Of the wave multipliers. Except the cable's going from the output to the mixer and the output to the uh, oscilloscope. And uh, we can just kind of play more feedback games just with this one little bottom module itself. Now let's actually just use that as a sound source and start running that through filters and messing around with it. back the filter back into the wave multipliers.
high pass filter output in as well. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot to uh, be done in there. Um, and again, that's just from this bottom section of the wave multiplier is feeding in to itself. Um, not using the DSG at all, actually not using the double knot, not using the CV processor at all. Um, just using the variable Q and then just a stereo mixer, which we aren't even really using uh, in any sophisticated way other than just, you know, uh, other than just adding the sounds together. Um, so that is, uh, some basic fun with feedback. Um, oh, it's 9.15. Okay. Um, yeah, the DOSG isn't getting too much love. Should we, let's play with the DOSG. Um, so I'm going to rip out all this and let's just play with the DOSG a bit. All right, so here's the DOSG, um, just a triangle wave for now. Um, let's listen to it. Or it's more of a sawtooth, but with the DOSG, you know, as you change the rise and fall, you actually change the shape of the wave itself. So you're changing both pitch and timbre at the same time. So we can get it somewhere like that. Uh, one basic uh, use of, uh, hold on. Uh, do I use any other modular gear or only the search? I do have a Eurorack modular um, up there that I've been sort of downsizing as I um, kind of uh, make it all the search. Um, there are a couple of nice fun Eurorack things that I still um, love and don't want to get rid of. But in general, um, I find the surge just a lot more fun and a lot more uh, it's just much easier for me to um, get into really weird um, sounds really you know kind of just shred a bit you know um, you can do that on the Eurorack as well but I don't know um, I've also come to really like the f the form factor of the 4U um, the size of the modules themselves is really nice and patching with banana cables um, and you know just sort of exploring feedback on a more um, intentional basis has been a lot more fun. Um, so one uh, basic use of feedback for the DUSG is to take the output and go into the voltage control of the rise and fall to get uh, more exponential or logarithmic shapes. That's in the fall and in the rise. You can also feed back into the volt per octave input, but there's no knobs associated with that. You can feed the output back into the input. Um, the typical way to get it cycling, because um, it doesn't cycle by default, is to patch the gate output to the trigger input. So a lot of basic uses of the dual slope generator start from feedback as a kind of, uh, you know, as a sort of first principle. Um, I can uh, take the gate output and also use that to trigger the bottom one. And 
I'll just use the bottom one now to control the top one um, and just play around with it for a minute and see what happens. I'm not gonna run through uh, this. Uh, I'm gonna run this through the filter and add the filter in to see what happens. Oh, 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 oh,
Uh, downloading the visit, I don't know about. Um, I don't know if this is going to be made available after. Um, I, I, I just don't know. Um, the double knot at all for composing tracks. Yeah, let's move on to the double knot because the double knot is kind of the other like major thing um, to use. I, I basically use it uh, in a bunch of different ways. Um, so yeah, I'm going to pull apart this patch. Um, and yeah. Favorite modular artists? Um, can I answer none? I think that's generally my answer. Um, I mean, I, I just don't think that uh, synthesizers make people's music interesting. I don't think the gear that people use is... I mean, I, I enjoy sharing it with other people, um, but I think uh, the gear is only a way to make um, a, a piece of music, you know, something uh with some i don't know uh humanity or some sort of i don't know something that 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 you want to be a piece of music um that doesn't necessarily need to be uh something that gets like released or in any situation it can just be um you know music you make for yourself at home um but i don't think that like uh making the gear you use like the focal point of music is is very interesting um i find most of the music that sort of um advertises itself as modular um is pretty terrible um okay so the double knot uh yeah so the double knot um it's gonna be kind of tricky well, let's see what happens. So yeah, the double knot, um, it has these two oscillators and then um, the double knot's basically symmetrical. So the bottom is the same as the top. Um, they're two independent voices. So you have the oscillator, it goes to an eight stage shift register and then it goes to an envelope generator. Um, and then there's a clock over here. Um, so, uh, some basic ways the double knot can be used. Um, I have the double knot going to the mixer now. Um, so you can, if you insert a, a high bit into the shift register, it flows down. And what it is, is this is an eight bit shift register. So I enter a bit, which is just a high or low, uh, voltage and the clock, uh, moves it forward down this, um, down this uh, shift register. Um, so each clock pulse moves it down and there's eight stages. Um, the first bit uh, triggers the envelope generator and then the bit flows down. You have access to bits five, six, seven, and eight here. Um, and this output here is what's called a, um, uh, it, it, what it is is a, a, a voltage divider ladder um, into a, a digital to analog converter. So what it does is basically um, the the bits present in the shift register at any time are converted into an analog voltage at this output. And so if these bits are all the way full, um, so let's say, and, and bit one is the most significant bit and bit eight is the least. So if these bits are all one, 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 um, then it's going to be the highest voltage. And if they're all zero, 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 it's going to be the lowest. Um, but as that, um, as that, uh, bit flows down, um, the voltage changes. So, if I use it to control the frequency, 
you can hear as the bit goes travels down um it sort of the the pitch goes down and um yeah so what i can do is start to um feed back these into the input and start to cycle things to get rhythms Okay, so that's already one, you know, um, little pattern there. I can play with the FM. I actually made... Taking requests now, Jesus Christ. synth zone here. All right. Um, so we have a pattern there. We can also make another pattern with the other uh, um, shift register and oscillator thing. Double knot, um, as I sort of mentioned before, yeah, I mean, this is just such a fun synthesizer to get really interesting patterns quickly. Um, so we could throw some delay and spring reverb on this.
way that it's making pitches is, yeah, the, the ship register, you have bits going down, but so at any given time, the ship register is, has eight different bits, and they're either one or zero, and that eight-bit word is, is converted into an analog voltage. Um, so the more ones in there, um, you know, the higher the voltage. Well, I mean, it depends on where the ones are, but, you know, um, it just takes, it's going to take, yeah, the, the 8-bit uh, binary number in there and convert it to a voltage. I don't know, I can't remember what the max is when the um, bits are all 1. Um, it's probably like 5 volts or something. is just the Dupfer A199 spring reverb uh, Eurorack module. It's uh, cheap and, and, and great. I've had it forever um, and I love it. Um, the delay I'm using is the OTO Machines BIM. Um, maybe a, a, a bit later I can um, do a little walk through of the setup, but I'm, I'm not using very much of it right now. Well, I mean, actually these days this is kind of most of what I have except for a couple uh, other synths and one or two drum machines, but um, but yeah, um, so this is fun. Uh, another way you can use the double knot, um, and maybe I'll we'll do some like jamming later. But I want to show uh, one other way to use the double knot, which is to use it um, to do rungling. So I'm gonna unpatch this first. So um, the Rungler was a circuit uh, invented by Rob Hordike, um, and the double knot um, takes its inspiration mostly. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to speak to, um, I don't want to speak to uh, the creator's intentions or anything. But um, the the Rungler concept is sort of a central one in the double knot. So um, I can uh, the the Rungler. Um, 
has two oscillators. And those two oscillators um, feed an 8-bit um, shift register um, followed by a digital to analog converter. So we have that here. We have two oscillators here. And what we'll do is we'll take the triangle output and put it into the input of one shift register. And we're going to take the square wave output of the other oscillator and use that to clock this shift register. And um, so we can... This input on all the way on the right is a clock input. There is a built-in clock here, but for now we're just not using it. Okay, so we have the triangle going into the bit. And the bottom one clocking it. But what gets more fun is if we take this R2R, this resistor ladder, followed by a digital to analog converter, and use that to adjust the frequencies of the two oscillators. So I'm going to patch that up. And so with this, and also with the uh, frequency modulation of the two oscillators together, um, we can start rungling. And uh, what I like to do when I go rungling is just kind of play around and find interesting sounds, just like with the surge, just like with anything else. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll just rungle for a bit here. Yes, uh, Muff, you're right. The red cable is um, the top oscillator just going into the uh, shift register and setting the bits high and low, and then um, the second oscillator is clocking it. How to use the two synths together. So yeah, um, one fun thing to do uh, is you can start by using some of these uh, square waves to just clock um, or just, just trigger the uh, variable Q filter. So let's do that.
We can also take, uh, we can also just kind of start to tie, I like to really think back to the name double knot and start to like tie these things together. So we can sort of take, and I, I like to think of knots as like using feedback to create um, uh, these sort of knotty structures um, that you can't untangle. And in fact, uh, I find what happens is voltages just kind of like get in the system and start like kind of perpetuating in the system, um, if that makes any sense. Um, so I'm just going to kind of uh, keep wrangling over here and sort of use it to play with the surge as well.
so yeah, sometimes, I don't, for like whatever reason, this is catching my ear. Um, and you can see, you can start to then find the very, it's hard to, it's hard to know exactly what's going to change this sound. Uh, it, it's hard to know how any knob is really going to affect it, um, given sort of all of the feedback going on. Um, but seems like this knob, very slight. That gets us something. Since both these knobs have to do with changing the frequency of this top oscillator. Alright, so I think I'm just going to play around for a bit um, until, uh, you know, I or you uh, get tired of it. Um, 
So if you want to ask any questions, um, I think it's, yeah, it's 10 o'clock now. So if you want to ask any questions, you know, uh, ask away, and I am here to answer. Um, do I mostly sample these sounds for use in Ableton? Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of times. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'll just record this and, you know, um, sometimes I'll get something that, you know, I kind of like and can sort of, uh, I don't know, be something in its own way. Um, or you can play around with them in Ableton, you know, record something, uh, reverse it, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, stuff with the SSG. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll do some quick SSG patches, um, just kind of alongside the double knot here. Um, I'm going to loop a DS, or yeah, I'm going to loop a DSG just to have an oscillator. And I'm going to patch the, uh, I'll just do the basic sort of um, random voltage generator patch with the SSG. Um, so to do this, um, you need to first take a noise source, um, you know, some sort of random voltage and go into the input of the step generator. Um, the sample and hold source is the sort of unique thing to search, um, and it was designed um, to give an equal uh, probability distribution amongst all voltages um, sort of in the range. Um, and yeah, so it, it sort of functions different from white noise. We can sort of compare them, and it, it might be a bit subtle, but um, so I'm going to take the output of that. To the input of the step side, um, and then there's this sort of mysterious coupler in the middle. The coupler is a comparator, so the output of the smooth side goes into one side of the comparator, and the output of the step side goes into the other side of the comparator. And when, um, I can't remember if it's the smooth side is the higher one or the step side, but whatever. Um, let's just say it's smooth. When the smooth side is higher than the step side, this voltage is positive, and when it's lower, it's negative. And actually, um, it's just a very basic binary voltage, um, off and on. Uh, the red jacks on surge are always binary voltages, gates, um, you know, uh, off or on. Um, and yeah, so what I'll do is I'll take the uh, output there, and patch this into the sample of the step side. So that's going to um, sample the stepped generator, which is basically, you know, um, a stepped voltage generator. Um, you know, it, 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 it cuts a smooth signal um, into discrete steps and holds, the, it's a sample and hold, and it holds the voltage at, at um, whatever the level is until the next sample trigger comes in. And then I'll take it and also go to the input of this smooth generator. And now it comes alive, and I have um, actually three flavors of, um, of voltages coming out here. Um, so I have the stepped, volta stepped random voltages. I have smooth random voltages coming out of the smooth side. And I've got random rhythms coming out of the coupler itself. So, um, uh, you know, a sample and hold circuit is used often um, to create random voltages, but um, those random voltages are always sort of coming out um, to 
determined by a clock. Um, so they're always, um, you know, steady as per the clock coming in. Um, here, the rhythm is totally unstable. Um, so it, it's, it's quite a bit more fun.
surge modular is too much um i don't know i mean it's like anything i guess the more you have the more fun it is but i mean i have not gotten to the end of ex even scratching the surface of what um of what this sort of setup can do um is there any reason i went with the specific surge modules instead of one of their full boxes um I mean, I wanted to build it myself, um, so that was one consideration. I don't know, it's a little more customizable. Um, none of the random source panels in particular had the resonant EQ, um, which uh, to me is just non-stop fun, um, so I wanted to make sure I had one of those. Um, I already have one in Eurorack um, that I run things through all the time, but uh, you know wanted to have one in here too. 